Hello to everyone in the Americas. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you about what we've been up to at the IET during a very challenging year. This includes looking at our IET 2030 strategy, our societal challenges, and of course, our fantastic 150th anniversary. But first, we want to address the pandemic and the vital work that's been going on behind the scenes of the engineering and technology world. A new decade is usually a cause for reflection, celebration, and hope of great things to come. But the coronavirus pandemic was the last thing we expected going into 2020. The worldwide impact of COVID-19 was sudden and dramatic, and we saw our world change overnight as we all stayed at home to save lives. But we never lost hope. One thing we have seen across the globe is that the resilience and kindness of people in the face of adversity is prevailing. We came together to support one another and stood together in the fight against the pandemic. Engineering and technology have been at the forefront of helping us through this fight against the pandemic. As engineers, we recognize that we have a duty of care to society, which we are proud to uphold. The UK's National Health Service and other care providers around the world have suffered under the pressure of the COVID-19 outbreak. But as an institution with access to some of the best engineering minds in the world, we have worked together to do our bit to help tackle this pandemic. Organizations and individuals came together like never before, from building ventilators and hospitals to developing social distancing technology. Everyone did what they could to help. Human expansion and environmental damage mean that more pandemics are possible, while the climate emergency poses the biggest threat of all. But engineers are leading the fight against this. And at the IET, we've identified five societal challenges that we're focusing our efforts on where the engineering profession and the IET can make a real impact. This is part of our IET 2030 strategy which is about what we do over the next decade to maintain our relevance for our audiences of industry, practitioners, academia, and society. Each part of the strategy is of equal importance and combined will ensure we serve our audiences better and of course benefit society even more. Each challenge has been inspired by the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the European Union's Horizon 2020 challenges and the UK's Industrial Strategy Grand Challenges. So, our societal challenges are sustainability and climate change, digital futures, healthy lives, people-centric infrastructure, and productive manufacturing. Now, by working together, we can build really compelling propositions for each of these areas that support and meet the needs of our stakeholders and wider society. This will demonstrate and strengthen the IET's reputation and credibility to be a trusted and recognized authority on these topics. Our first priorities have been sustainability and climate change, as well as digital futures, whilst at the same time, we are building the roadmaps for healthy lives. Now, as we move forward with our strategy, we will start to include the other societal challenges in our plans. So what do we want to achieve through our 2030 strategy? Well, by 2030, we will accelerate the pace of development and adoption of technology that supports the move towards a carbon zero future. We'll increase public trust in digital and support practitioners through a period of change with the application of standards, regulation, and the sharing of best practice. We'll draw a professionally registered membership of 100,000 through our reputation of excellence. We plan to recognize a membership of 200,000 with a global engineering and technician digital audience of a million. We want to solve the world's problems as engineering and technology communities, best information, intelligence and analytics provider. And we will significantly increase the number of quality engineers and technicians entering the workforce and ensure that our influence is seen in society every day. For 150 years, the IET has existed for the purpose of working to engineer a better world. 
So it is our mission to inspire, inform, and influence the global engineering community, supporting technology innovation to meet the needs of society. Our IET 2030 strategy will ensure we continue to be relevant and that we are resilient enough to evolve over the next 150 years and continue to make a real difference across the world. Speaking of 150, I've been lucky enough to be the president of the IET for our 150th anniversary year. I've been using my year-long term in office to champion difference makers, people who are having a massive impact on the world around us and inspire more young people into engineering and technology. After all, engineers are difference makers. We design, we invent, fix and improve and are changing our world for the better. We live in a world that is greatly shaped by wonderful intellects. These minds have created some of the most incredible inventions and innovations humanity has ever seen. There have been many engineering heroes throughout time. These engineers not only provide us with some invaluable societal advancements, but also they are our role models to inspire the next generation of engineers. In May, the IET turned 150, and our anniversary gives us a fantastic opportunity to celebrate our rich history and look forward to the future. Throughout the year, we've been celebrating difference makers who are using engineering to help solve some of the world's biggest challenges. We're connecting with young people who want to make a difference, to establish a community of difference makers who will pledge to bring about change and inspire others. Engineering and technology have been improving our world and shaping our future for centuries, from the music you listen to and the phone in your hand, to the clean water you drink and the innovations that are helping to restore our oceans. Engineering and technology are at the heart of everything. Engineers bring ideas to life. They turn dreams into reality and make solutions to big challenges possible. We want young people to know that whether they're into sports, music, fashion, flying, healthcare, or improving our climate, there is a place in engineering and technology for them. But it's no secret that the engineering community currently has a global perception problem. So it's vital that we have more young people considering engineering and technology careers to ensure that future pipeline of talent. Whether an engineer is working in London, in New Delhi, Auckland, Rio, or even on the seabed, we need them to spread the word about the work they do. As engineers, it is our duty to speak passionately about our careers so that more people join us and they have the chance to change the world too. To achieve this, we need to be telling the stories of incredible difference makers around the world so that young people become inspired to solve engineering challenges. And the IET are already doing some incredible work around inspiring young people. This includes Engineer a Better World. Engineer a Better World is our multi-award winning campaign to encourage young people to become interested in STEM and understand how engineering is all around us. And of course, to consider a career in engineering. The campaign shows parents and their children the huge variety of exciting, creative and stimulating careers in modern engineering. The campaign has been running since 2015 and has been very successful in altering perceptions of engineering amongst young people and showing them just how broad the engineering and technology sector is. Engineering Open House Day is also part of this campaign and is an educational and fun day out for parents and their children. Companies are invited to open their doors and give behind the scenes access to the wonderful world of engineering and technology. On top of these fantastic initiatives, we planned a whole range of brand new fun and creative activities for our 150th anniversary year, which aim to highlight the positive impact engineers are having and will continue to have on our world. Now, of course, many of our plans had to be changed due to the pandemic, but we've still been very busy. At the beginning of our anniversary year, we announced our newest honorary fellows. We're also working with the fashion industry, looking at sustainability. Our Global Engagement Fund is supporting volunteers around the world to run 36 exciting events. 
we launched our Difference Makers campaign, which is a groundbreaking movement inspiring us all to make a change, no matter how big or small, by sharing remarkable stories of how engineering and technology are saving the world around us. We announced our STEM Personality of the Year. Our annual Engineering Open House Day goes global for the very first time. We'll be at the World Expo in Dubai and preparing for the first LEGO League International Open in London in 2022. And we'll be planting a Faraday forest to reduce the IET's carbon footprint. So, as you can see, we are having an action-packed, exciting year with an important call to action to get people involved and inspire more difference makers and engineers of tomorrow. We'd love your support in helping to spread the word too. Check out the IET social media channels to get involved and help us inspire more people into the wonderful world of STEM. Danielle, there is so much for us to celebrate and look forward to in participating in our 150th anniversary. Thank you so much for listening. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you all stay safe and well. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. It's great to be here. I wanna thank the Institution for Engineering and Technology for inviting me to, to share a few thoughts. Um, and it's just an incredible time to be talking to you about space because we're in a renaissance, a transformation of space that is, uh, is grabbing hold of industry, governments, and will um, provide for a, a, a new set of capabilities from space that will serve humankind for generations and generations. You know, we're in an era where uh, space activities is moving very quickly from an act, uh, a community of very heroic but very narrow efforts to a, um, a, a more globally focused uh, space industry and collaboration um, where we're more connected, where we're more efficient, and we're a more knowledgeable global community. And space will fuel that as we go forward. Uh, you know, as so we're in an epoch where that's all taking place, where, where space activities are becoming a global collaboration. Industries and communities who never thought they would ever use space are now taking hold of it and using it to improve life here on Earth. And as we move forward there, as space travel uh, becomes more and more capable, more and more available, more and more efficient, we're going to see humanity moving to the next step. And that's going to be harnessing the incredible resources and capabilities that are out in space. And so even more than just connecting us as a globe and informing us about our world, we'll be able to augment um, the needs of this planet, the needs of humanity, so that we can be gentler on our local community, on our local planet, our local environment, and, and make use of uh, resources, minerals, energy uh, in space. And so that'll be the next exciting chapter. And once that is taking place, I mean, we're hearing lots and lots of people looking forward to okay, human exploration and presence and colonization. And I'm sure that'll be the next step beyond that. Um, through these evolutions, it's gonna be very, very important that we keep in mind our presence and our effect. Um, you know, clearly humanity, as we've expanded and grown, has not had a tremendously uh, uh, beneficial effect on our environment. The space environment, just like the Earth environment, is not, um, uh, is, is not without risk uh, if we don't um, grow in a, a logical and, and, and collaborative and, and coordinated way. So space debris. And, and, and aspects like that need to be considered. Norms of behavior, rites of passage, all of that is going to become very important as we work together and coordinate lots of complex activities in space. You know, Sir Richard Branson has been a, an advocate for space applications and capabilities as we, as we open up space for good. So here's a few words from Richard himself on how we see space and how it can help humankind and our world. Small satellites will play a crucial role in the fight against climate change, 
providing us with the knowledge and data to overcome local and global challenges alike. Real-time satellite data is already improving how we tackle global issues such as deforestation, sustainable food production, and disaster response. These same satellites will also help us monitor ocean health and illegal fishing. It is wonderful to see how Earth observation and satellite applications are helping us inform our actions, restore nature, and protect businesses and communities from the impacts of climate change. The environmental intelligence gained from satellite data will be key in shaping policy to meet our global carbon reduction targets. Satellites provide much needed assistance in environmental monitoring, and the latest generation of small satellites promise even better quality information to ensure we really understand the issues at hand. Low Earth orbit satellites will play an important role in connectivity because they can offer low latency and they can help keep remote communities around the world connected. They are a great complement to the larger geostationary satellites and ground networks. In addition to providing more accurate and frequent data to support the rapid expansion and needs of the world we live in, the next generation of small satellites will be able to connect and help people in remote places that need it most. That's why at Virgin Orbit, we are on a mission to provide dedicated and responsive access to low Earth orbit, leading the way in responsible launch and expanding that to Cornwall soon. As we get closer to launching from UK soil, I'm getting more and more excited about the possibilities and benefits that increased launch capabilities will bring to life on Earth and the protection of our beautiful planet. You know, Morgan Stanley estimates that the space economy will grow from what it, it's currently about $400 billion to uh, well over a trillion dollars in the next 19, 20 years. Um, uh, incredible innovation is taking place in space. Key drivers uh, for that are low cost and, and more capable satellite technologies. Um, the, the same technology that has allowed smartphones to serve us and maybe rule our lives sometimes um, is also available and is allowing satellites to be more and more capable. Other technologies like ion propulsion, uh, incredible, uh, incredibly more efficient power systems, um, very much more uh, sophisticated and capable apertures like phased arrays, all of these are coming together um, uh, with the computational power on the ground to coordinate all these assets to make applications uh, that will be changing the way we live. The Internet of Things connecting packages to, to consumers, um, coordinating uh, logistics across trains and, and ships and automobiles and airplanes, um, making sure that we can stay connected when we need uh, help and assistance, through weather, through through disasters, scientific research, um, all of that is becoming more available to government and, and private sectors. These technologies are lowering the barrier to entry. So satellites are much more affordable. Satellite production is popping up around the world. Um, and, and ideas of how regions can best use satellites, how industry or companies can best use satellites are now coming uh, to become a normal part of the discussion. I mean, these are these are in some cases ideas that 20 years ago wouldn't have wouldn't have been anywhere on the radar you know, because of the cost. I mean, uh, you know, a a satellite capability in orbit 20 years ago would have started with a, a discussion about raising half a billion dollars in capital. Now it's it's two orders or more uh, uh, reduced from that. You know, where, where Virgin Orbit fits in is that all of these satellites need transportation and that there, and there's a globe of space agencies, uh, almost 80 across the world, who are now endeavoring to create space economies in their countries. And Virgin Orbit, um, under the vision of Sir Richard Branson, you know, believes that, um, you know, business must be a force for good and that there's a tremendous good to be done in applying capabilities in space uh, that, that connect us as a globe uh, and provide resources to humanity to make us, honestly, a more efficient 
humanity in, in how we work and, and communicate and travel on this earth. Um, you know, we've developed an air launch system which has some very key differentiators. Uh, the flexibility of an airplane. I mean, since the beginning of uh, the space age, if you will, when, when aircraft engineers first came to Cape Canaveral to launch rockets, the, the first question was, well, why can't we operate the way we operate our airplanes? You know, on a routine basis, uh, with very clear instructions and flexibility. Um, and what we've done at Virgin Orbit is basically implement that using an airplane. So we use a 747. Um, it allows us a huge amount of robustness and flexibility in how we coordinate our launches. We can turn any airport into a spaceport. And that's exactly what we did on January 17th in Mojave when uh, we sailed off on a, um, on a, a, a summer morning and uh, left the airport, climbed up to 35,000 feet above the Pacific, and an hour later, um, 10 satellites for NASA were, were floating in their orbit and, and being activated. Um, we have a vision of providing that capability globally. Uh, we're working very closely, for instance, with the UK Space Agency and Cornwall in providing space launch capability from Cornwall. We're very excited about driving to achieve that next year, uh, working similarly with the RAF. We, we have an RAF pilot who's been uh, loaned to us, uh, uh, Flight Lieutenant uh, Matthew Stannard, Stanny. Um, and Stanny actually flew on this last mission and will be uh, piloting our, our, our next mission um, as we move forward with the system and uh, with the eyes of creating a global capability in space. Some of the key differentiators in air launch from ground launch systems are one, just energy. Um, you know, we use the muscle of a 747 to get us to 35,000 feet, the better part of Mach 1, and two thirds of the way through the atmosphere before the, ro the rocket has to do any work at all. And so that, that provides a tremendous efficiency for the system. Flexibility. We are um, not connected to a congested rocket launch range. Rather, we are uh, given the green light to fly by the airport tower. Um, so it gives us tremendous flexibility, resilience, um, so that we can launch at any time from any place to any orbit. Our environmental impact is minimized. Instead of having to fly in the middle of nowhere, where really ground launch rockets have to uh, launch from to keep the public safe, we fly from an airport and then fly out over the, over the ocean. Um, to make sure that we start the rocket in a very, very safe place. Um, that provides for a much lower uh, footprint on the ground. We reuse an, air, an, or, an airport, for instance. Um, we don't put smoke and soot out in a wildlife preserve like Cape Canaveral or Karoo. Um, we, we don't throw acoustic energy uh, nearly to the degree that a ground launch rocket would you know, and, and again, in a wildlife preserve where, where animals are, are feeling that impact. Um, so air launch has, has environmental benefits as well, especially in that very important first leg of the way to space. You know, I mentioned our uh, first mission in January uh, of this year, where we uh, were just thrilled to be able to take uh, NASA research satellites to orbit. We repeated uh, that performance at the end of June, uh, where we had now the rest of the market addressed. Uh, we had a mission that included commercial customers, including Sat Revolution. Um, we had um, an MOD, um, the, the Royal Netherlands Air Force, with their first uh, satellite, Brick 2, and the DOD all on one mission. It was a tremendous collaboration across the the sectors for spacecraft, it was a great collaboration uh, between us and our customers, uh, and it was an incredible day uh, to be standing there uh, on the flight line with uh, Richard Branson as we, uh, we, we wished our, our Cosmic Girl aircraft and, and, and launch stage a good flight, and then a, an hour later saw uh, seven more satellites taken to orbit and, and activated. It's difficult to describe the intense focus the team has during a launch. 
but this video will give you a little bit of a ride through the, the events of that day. Um, and I think you'll feel uh, the intensity and the joy when those satellites were put in orbit. Team Rocket, already on Rocketnet, looking for confirmation your system is still go. Thermal? Nobody's go. AVI? Go. Flight software? Flight software's go. GNC? GNC's go. Payload? Payload's go. S1 prop? Go. S2 prop? S2 prop is go. Systems? Go. Copy all things. LCC and control room, we are go for takeoff. Okay. LDC on control room, we are go for terminal count. Release. Release, release, release. Release confirmed. Newton 3 startup confirmed. Stage 1 burn nominal. S band lock for Baja TM data is confirmed. Mexico Alpha achieved. Stage 1 trajectory nominal. Music to my ears. Thanks. Element roll over base. Uh, stage 1 burn is nominal, passing 120,000 feet. Newton 3 shutdown confirmed. Stage 7 break marks broken. Stage 4 startup complete. S2 prop, stage 2 burn is nominal. Downrange, O'Higgins, locked. AOS and frame lock at Mauritius. LD on control room. For those who haven't heard, we have a confirmation of all seven satellites deployed. All systems are good. They're kind of back to land. Copy stepping off. It was a great day to go to space with everybody. LD, LD, Cosmic Girl is on the ground. Welcome back, Cosmic Girl. We are seeing now in the market, you know, now that we have crossed what is a very, very broad chasm in launch from going from an aspirational to an operational system, we're seeing tremendous market activity uh, where we're tracking uh, over 100 uh, customers um, and, and getting an, an enormous amount of market uh, uh, activity in all those sectors, uh, commercial, government, um, civil, uh, national security, as well as spaceport activity. In the area of, area of spaceports, in addition to focused on uh, focusing on Cornwall, we have now an agreement with OIDA um, to, to fly out of an airport in, in um, Japan. Uh, we have an agreement in Brazil, uh, and we are talking to and working with uh, many, many other countries uh, to help serve their launch needs from their sovereign shores, to make sure that they always have access to space uh, and, and, and always on their schedule. So what's coming up for Virgin Orbit and how do we see the future as a company as we evolve? Um, first of all, we're working on our next launch, which should be this fall um, with a new, another uh, set of customers. Uh, and it's exciting to be ramping up in production. So that'll make three launches for this year. We're looking to double that uh, rate next year and, and perform six launches, and then at more than double that the year after. So we're on a steep climb. Um, it's an incredible, incredibly exciting time to be in the factory as we see the process um, known now to the team uh, and the incredible innovation now taking place in the factory as we learn to, to build our rockets more and more efficiently. You know, we've used the state of the art in manufacturing in our factory. Um, we have um, a 100% composite rocket, really the simplest two stage rocket you could possibly make. Uh, a composite structure with linerless tanks, one single engine on each uh, stage, um, you know, a, a, the highest reliability because it's got the lowest amount of parts and the, and the, the most efficiency because of the the, the, the muscle of the 747 uh, and the simplicity of the rocket that we're making. We're using aircraft manufacturing techniques to build that composite structure so we can make tanks in days 
instead of taking months that you know where classical methods uh, have typically been used. And we've got a unique partnership with DMG Mori, um, who is really a, a leader in uh, additive manufacturing, so that we can build engines. You know, the, one of the most complex things, uh, or the most complex thing a, a rocket has, um, you know, about ten times faster than classical methods. It's an incredible partnership because it benefits us in that we have their state-of-the-art machines in our factory, serial number ones in most cases, um, and we feed back our lessons learned as we beta test their product and they can modify and, and optimize their product with a, a collaborative industry partner. Um, it's an exciting time truly in manufacturing where the automation, where tens of billions of dollars have been spent in producing aircraft and automobiles using this kind of technology is now being applied to um, a very simple, uh, very efficient rocket. As we look a little further into the evolution of the product, you know, we'll be adding a third stage to our system. We'll be augmenting um, the capabilities and, and, and adding performance as we go forward to, to enhance our market share. We'll be ramping up the production rate, as I mentioned. We'll also be working with government in for other uses, uh, other orbits like geo, lunar, interplanetary, um, using a, a third stage in conjunction with the system. We'll also be working very closely with the satellite sector. Um, if you've noticed, we've we've been collaborating with companies like Arcit, like uh, systems like Hypersat, um, and, and others to 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 not only give them a ride to space, but be an accelerator and participate in their business uh, in a productive way, so that we can help grow the small satellite sector, help provide uh, some of the services that are being offered. So there's a tremendous amount of adjacency and, and uh, uh, collaborative uh, uh, coordination and, and, and drive forward that's happening right now as we work together, company with company, companies and government, government to government, um, driving space forward to, to serve humankind. You know, we've had a tremendously close and collaborative working relationship with the UK Space Agency um, with the RAF, with the Department for Transportation, uh, and other government agencies um, in the UK. Recently, we were asked to participate um, in the activities around the G7 summit. And so we, we put together a, a rocket uh, ba based on not just sort of model, it wasn't balsa wood, it was real uh, rocket development hardware, and we brought it to the G7 so that we could talk about uh, the, the opportunities, the, the opportunity in Cornwall to bring launch, as well as the rest of the world. We had an incredible uh, and engaging discussion with the Prime Minister, uh, as well as the Secretary of State for Transportation. Prime Minister Johnson, um, Secretary of State Shapps, uh, spent a lot of time with us. We had a, a great discussion, questions about how space will evolve economically, uh, the science of, of uh, climate and, and how to better understand our planet, as well as national security uh, for the UK and collaboration across uh, with the United States, with, with other allies, and how space can uh, best be coordinated in, in, in all of those sectors. Um, it was a tremendous opportunity to be in Cornwall, uh, to be with the Prime Minister, uh, to see other leaders, and it, and it really... Um, that whole experience drove home to us uh, the incredible potential for these communities and, and, and for the globe to be coordinating together. You know, as I said, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in space, uh, in the space business right now. Um, it's a renaissance, a rare inflection point in the history of, of space evolution. And if we collaborate together, if we manage our evolution carefully, um, the benefits to humanity and to our world will be boundless. Thank you. Well, after that incredible IET at 150 Edge talk, I am super excited to now speak to Dan Hart, CEO of Virgin Orbit. 
Dan has over three decades of experience working in aerospace programs, spanning human space flight, satellite development, launch missile defense, and running through all phases of the aerospace product life cycle. He joined Virgin Orbit from Boeing, where he led incredible government satellite programs, developing and managing missions for the US Department of Defense, NASA, NOAA, and other national programs. He is a passionate and committed advocate for STEM education and serves on the executive board of California Science Center, as well as the Dean's Advisory Council, California State University, Long Beach's College of Engineering. So Dan, can you tell us what the vision and mission is for Virgin Orbit and how you're gonna achieve it? At Virgin Orbit, we want to open up space for a whole host of new applications. Um, there's an enormous amount going on in space these days. And as a small satellite uh, launcher, uh, a company involved in the small satellite community, um, we want to make sure that we're, we're providing the transportation so that the applications can get to space. We want to um, see companies, countries that otherwise wouldn't have transportation and the ability to operate in space secure those. We also wanna be a, a, a right hand for national security for civil space. Um, there's just an enormous amount of opportunity. We've chosen to really push technology forward in space launch by uh, creating a liquid air launch system, the first orbital liquid air launch system that's ever been created, which has you know, unique flexibilities uh, to operate anywhere um, and an incredible efficiency in, in using a 747 aircraft uh, to do uh, the first leg of, of the journey to space. And how did you get to where you are today? Where did it all begin and, and what really drives you? You know, I, 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 I think about that often. Um, I guess it was a summer evening in 1969 that where it all sort of coalesced in my head. I was, I was eight years old and was asked to stay up late at night to watch uh, some people come down a ladder onto the moon. Um, I think that clipped and the rest of my life has been studying uh, to work in space, um, getting a job at Kennedy Space Center when I came out of school to be part of Space Lab, the first European American real strong collaboration in space. Um, and and it, the journey just took off there in engineering operations, uh, leading programs, leading companies, uh, but all, all to push humanity forward in, in space. So are we all going to have our own mini satellites one day? And, and what does the future look like when it comes to small satellites? The, the access to satellites uh, and satellite data is going up exponentially. And so whether we'll each have our own, I don't know. But today, you know, organizations, countries, companies that never thought they would have access to, to data or have their own satellite now find that it, it's a, a key part of their economy, a key part of their business, their national security, or, or a part of their key understanding of the world around them. Um, the cost of having a satellite in low Earth orbit has gone down uh, probably uh, two orders of magnitude or more. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time to be in the industry. And why is democratizing space so important? You know, I think that it takes barriers down and it connects us together. Um, you know, you think about the digital divide, for instance. Um, it's similar in space, you know, availability of data, understanding the world and having common understanding of what's happening uh, in, in our environment, in our climate, um, what is um, opportunities for, for companies to uh, better transport to be more efficient in how they how we live. Uh, I, I mean, in every aspect of space, space has crept into how we live in ways that I think a lot of people just don't see. You know, they look at their phones and they get their GPS coordinates and don't realize well that S stands for satellite. Um, and, and so I think democratizing space broadens out the opportunities, makes us a much more cohesive uh, humanity, makes us a much more efficient humanity and how we live on this planet and use its resources. So how can we use space as a force for good? I mean, connection, the opportunities that, you know, that never would have been available in the middle of nowhere, pick a country, pick a region, 
Um, and now people can, using a small device, communicate via satellite or get information about their region or how best to farm, how best to communicate, how best to travel. Um, all of that is allowing people everywhere. And it's really incumbent then upon the rest of us to make sure that growth happens. It, grow, it, it happens in a equitable, fair way. And, and in a lot of ways, you know, that's what we're about. We're, we, have, we are a platform that can take any airport in this world and in a very short amount of time, it can become a spaceport that allows the people of the area to access space. Okay, so I'm really excited to know, what are you and the team working on at the moment? Can you tell us? Well, right now, I mean, where we are in this company is we, this year we moved from an aspirational launch company into an operational space company. Um, on January 17th, we put uh, 10 satellites for NASA into orbit. Uh, in a beautiful, successful mission. Uh, and on June 30th, again, we performed another mission where we put a, a satellite up for the Royal Netherlands Air Force, their first um, uh, a sat revolution in Poland, a commercial company, and satellites for the DOD in, in, one, in one mission. And that's kind of a microcosm of what is happening where there are small satellites and applications that are just bursting and we want to be there to serve them. So right now we are ramping up. So there's a rocket in the factory that is uh, being readied for a launch this fall. Um, there are uh, a, a whole slew of other ones. We'll, we'll double our launch rate uh, next year and, and launch at least six times. Um, and we will then ramp up further the year after that. So ramping up is a big part, expanding into other markets. We also plan um, to launch out of uh, other countries. So we're, we're gonna come to Cornwall for instance, and perform a launch uh, from Cornwall. Uh, and, and we're working towards that next year. Um, Guam, uh, we're working with the Japanese in Oita, um, uh, with ANA and other partners. We're working with the Brazilians. We're, we're working globally. So countries, companies, uh, applications, and we are thrilled to be in the middle of them um, and, and at a point, an inflection point in this industry um, where, where there's an enormous amount of innovation and we're at, at an inflection point in this company at the same time. And it's very exciting. Can you just describe the current state of the space industry and, and how it's changing over time? You know, there are transformations going on right now. There's a conjunction of multiple transformations and that's driving this renaissance of space. Um, you've seen an enormous amount of private investment go into space which is fueling innovation and, and, att and, and attempts to try things differently uh, in applications and systems and platforms, and that's gonna continue on. Uh, it's really exciting, you know, and some of them will succeed and other ones won't, but the, the technology, the ideas, and the space community is developing. At the same time, technology has allowed for a new suite of satellites. Um, you know, electronics, the same electronic advances that have made smartphones that can now run our lives, um, can make satellites uh, that used to be the size of a, a school bus, um, the size of a toaster, uh, the size of a microwave. Um, and that's, that's, that's really allowing a lot of different communities to have access to satellites. Um, ion propulsion used to be something that was in science fiction. Now it's on almost every satellite. Um, phased array antennas, power systems becoming much, much more efficient. All of these are making these satellites extremely capable. So that there's a technology transformation that is feeding into this. And then on top of that is this international collaboration in space. If you look at the world today, there are nearly 80 space agencies across the world, nearly 80, and it's growing steadily. And every single one of those space agencies has a mission to better understand our planet, our solar system, um, our, our universe and our world around us, to spur economic growth in space in their local communities and, and, and support the national security of their country as it relates to how space is used. Every single one of those countries. So there's a multiplying factor that's going on at the same time. So technology, private industry, and governments are all aligned right now. And that's why you're seeing the acceleration that we're seeing in space.
So what is Virgin Orbit's purpose and, and how does it fit into that broader industry? Well, we want to open up space for good. And so we want to work with all of these companies across the world with all of these ideas that are serving humankind and make sure they have a, a, as direct a road as possible to getting their systems fielded, activated, and operating. And the transportation leg is a very, very key aspect of that. We also want to make launch, space launch, available to those 80 countries or a good part of them. Um, and we have this unique ability as our system and the technology we've developed to be transportable, to be mobile. So we can pack up and, and fly across and, and perform a launch, or we can easily take and reuse a 747 aircraft. And there's a lot of the 747s becoming available right now. A, a runway and any runway in the world can, can then access space. So it's, it's democratizing space, it's opening up space, it's, and it's opening it up to serve humankind. That's what lights our fire here. Uh, and the applications are, are commercial, they're, they're, they're part of space exploration. I mean, exploring the moon, exploring Mars, exploring Venus and, and the other planets. And, and certainly they're also there for national security as countries want to have sovereign data. They want to have sovereign constellations and we can help our, our allies uh, achieve. And what customers does Virgin Orbit support with its launch services? Well, it's really all of the ones that I just mentioned. I mean, um, you know, we're not, uh, we're not a big rocket serving large geosynchronous satellites, but other than that, the, the amount of applications in low earth orbit, medium earth orbit, and even geo for small satellites is growing, growing. And so that really hits all sectors. And the fact that we've already launched now um, on commercial flights for all sectors in our, between our, our, our first and our second commercial flights kind of really under, underlines that point. Um, it was a great day to be with uh, the, the, the Royal Netherlands Air Force as they saw their first satellite ever get deployed and activated. It was a great day to be with Sat Revolution as they saw their birds uh, floating uh, beautifully. It was a great day when we were with NASA uh, and a whole host of university students saw their incredibly hard work go into a deployed and activated satellite in orbit that they could then start to do research on. And you've just had an amazing launch, haven't you? Tell us more about your most recent mission to space. It was, it was a beautiful day. So, you know, we, we get there um, typically fairly early in the day uh, and ready the rocket for launch. We load it with propellant. On this day, uh, we had a special guest with us. So R Richard Branson was uh, joining us and he was out on a flight line as we then disconnected uh, the rocket from the ground and, and readied the airplane uh, to push off. It was great to be with Richard on that day. Um, incredible excitement, incredible intensity on a launch day. I mean, anyone who has been at a space launch knows that there's no stronger focus. There's no stronger connection across a team than this single-minded, um, you know, concentration on the system, on the people, on the, the, the mission that's ahead of you. Uh, our pilots took control. We have, um, we have four people on the airplane, two launch engineers and two pilots who conduct launch. So we we transitioned control over to them. They taxied and took off and flew uh, over the Pacific Ocean on a very smooth, somewhat boring flight out. Um, and uh, what we do is we go into a little bit of a racetrack pattern. So we, we, we ready and go into terminal count as the pilot is, is getting the timing right to where we want it. Um, our, our pilots, uh, Kelly Latimer and uh, Eric Bipert, uh, uh, release the rocket. Uh, by the way, we had an RAF pilot, um, Matthew Standard, Stanny, uh, on, in the jump seat behind him. Uh, he's in training for the next mission. Um, and uh, the rocket took off. It's a two-stage rocket, so the first stage flew beautifully. We're all there pulling for it, uh, you know, mentally pulling it through the atmosphere, if you will, uh, as, it, as it flies through, as we go through max Q alpha, as we get through separation, as, we, as a second stage ignites and the fairing comes off. Um, we, uh, we had a beautiful flight of the second stage, at which point you lose data. 
uh, until we come around the Antarctica area. We picked it up again, saw the vehicle getting ready for its second and final burn, uh, which took place uh, just off of Antarctica. Um, and then we saw our uh, satellites uh, starting to leave the, the vehicle as they were ejected from their um, container. Uh, incredible excitement with our, with our um, customers who were there with us watching this. It was the first time we had a live stream going that was pushed out to the public. So it was awesome to see, A, our engineers that were now uh, anchors in a news, com a, a news show about our system and the incredible job that they did. And then the response from public, from our customers, from uh, government um, or, or in the United States, across the world. Um, and we were on cloud nine uh, as soon as those spacecraft left our, our, our rocket in their orbit. So an absolutely beautiful day. Now you just mentioned Richard Branson and he's recently had a pretty big week himself with Virgin Galactic. What's it like being part of the Virgin brand and, and how does it influence your team? You know, I think, I think Richard and I think Virgin sets a, a tone and a set of values that permeate uh, the companies in Virgin Group and, and I would say especially Virgin Orbit, um, where there's a special kind of openness, there is a special kind of excitement and joy and uh, curiosity and willingness to explore that is really emphasized uh, by Richard and Virgin Group. So it's, it's really fun, honestly. I think it adds, there's design that you wouldn't necessarily have associated with the brand. There's excitement about things that's going on with Richard, like the flight with Galactic that otherwise you wouldn't have. Um, and it spurs imagination. I mean, when Richard, um, will call on a regular basis to just get an update on how things are going. Um, but he usually brings an idea at the same time. Could we do this? Is this possible? I heard about this. Um, and, and for me personally, it pulls me out of the day to day and says, you know, what's achievable? What is in the order of the possible? And I think, you know, we try to, I try to, the leadership te try, team tries to push that forward uh, you know, throughout the team to to garner their ideas, because that's really where the best ideas lie. So that's really what we're about. Now, you know, launch is, is, a, is a intense, hard, very disciplined work, uh, but it, it really is a great marriage of excitement, imagination, creativity, and engineering to discipline, execution, and you end up with a great product, which is what we saw on June 30th. Finally, Dan, very important question. Do you have any advice for young engineers looking to get into the space industry? Wow, it is a great time to get into the space agency. Um, so one is think carefully about what area you want to work in. I mean, there's space launch, there's spacecraft design, there's space operations, there's ground infrastructure that are all really, really important. There's regulatory and uh, you know, and policy that is very important. I mean, we're at a point where we need to harness space in the right ways. Um, so think carefully about what you want to get into. I would say then, when you get into the, into an area, become an expert. You know, become somebody who is relied upon for that area, and that will take time. Give yourself some patience in as you build up the expertise and the reputation, and then look around and think about you know what are the other areas that you can you can in the adjacencies that you can also participate in so that you can build, you know, I mean, if you're like me, you'll, you like to, you like the system, you, you like to have a piece of, of a, ver a variety of parts, or if you really want to hone deeply down, I mean, think about who to work with so you can become, you know, the best guidance and nav navigation analyst, best structural dynamicist, best electronics designer, um, there is, um, and because those positions are incredibly important to the industry in advancing the technology in each of those areas. Those are choices, um, and uh, my hat's off to anybody coming into the industry. It is fantastic to see the talent that is coming in and the ideas that are coming from the next generation, and it's frankly a privilege to be working with them and, and to see and learn uh, new ways and new ideas from them and marry them with you know, the, the lessons that have been learned along the way.
Oh, thank you so much, Dan. It's been so great to talk to you. We really look forward to seeing Virgin Orbit complete more launches over the coming years. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined today for our IET at 150 America's Eng Talk. And we hope that you've enjoyed hearing about the new era of space architecture. I really hope that we get to see you again soon on another IET at 150 Global Eng Talk. Thank you. <laughs>